I, I'm saying, I, I'm uh, using this title, Side Door versus Front Door. How to open your church to reach more people from the city. Let's, let's pray. Our, our Savior, we ask your blessing for this presentation. So help me to communicate using the right word and that everyone may understand everything and we can connect each other. And once again, to, to see more ways to reach people in the cities. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, that is, uh, I'm, I'm showing you on the right side there, you see uh, a general conference session that took place in May 16, uh, 1913. This General session took place in Tacoma Park, Washington. Uh, you can see many of pioneers there. Ellen G. White was not there because of the advancing age. But she sent two letters. One of that, she uh, agreed, she welcomed all the people who come from different lands to that session. In another one, uh, Pastor uh, Asia Daniels opened the letter and he read, what is that? Christ is opening the hearts and minds of many in our large cities. The large and small cities and place night and afar off are to be working and working diligently, intelligently. Never draw back. The Lord will make the right impressions upon heart if you work in unison with his uh, spirit. So she, tell, she challenged the, the, the church leaders to move forward and to reach the big cities of that time. I'm enlarging a little bit more uh, what I have said about the work in the cities, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to give now uh, another perspective, okay? Uh, you see here another video from the world in which Ellen G. White lived around 1910 when she asked the church to work in the major metropolitan area. So she lived during the, the rise of the urbanization in America. And she seemed to fully understand uh, the implication of this demographic trend. You see here uh, one tenth. Uh, many parts of the world, especially here in Australia, um, the preaching, the use of tent evangelism was a big method. But when Ellen G. White urged, urged the church leaders to evangelize the large cities, uh, she clearly told them that they should move beyond evangelistic tent they should explore new methods, new ways of reaching people in the big cities. That's why there are some of her quotations like that one in which she, she said, new methods must be introduced. God's people must awake to the necessities of the time in which they are living. Some of the methods used in this work will be different from the methods used use in the past. But let no one, because of this, block the way by criticism. And she also says, in the cities of today, where there is so much to attract and please, the people can be interested by no ordinary effort. So the church must devise new ways to reach people and especially in so secular city like that one that you guys have here uh, in, in this place. Uh, so she, she said that in, in many big cities we should go beyond preaching and we should, and she suggested many uh, methodologies like corporate ministries, medical, 
evangelism, parish nursing, cooking schools, restaurant work, addictive recovered clinic, pool ministry, and evangelism in tourism centers and centers of commerce. There's more hustle and bustle. You see here, uh, New York. New York. In this city, uh, one of the, the, the same pastor who planted a church here in Australia, S. N. Haskell, he went to work there. He went to work there and he rented a 6 4 room and he uh, recruited a team of about 20 people. Some of them worked in nurse, Bible instructors, selling books. Uh, Bible readings, a lot of, uh, a lot of approaches. And, and that's supposedly to be the first center of influence. And he did very well. And later on, uh, S.N. Haskell's wife sent Ellen G. White a, a letter asking her if they are doing the right things to reach the big city of New York. And she sent her back a, a, a letter in which she, wow, what's happening? She sent a letter uh, and she commends, commended her work. She said, Brother Haskell, the Lord has given you an opening in New York City, and your mission work there is to be an example of what mission work in other cities should be. You are to make New York a center for missionary effort, from which work can be carried forward su 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 successfully. The Lord desires this center to be a training school for workers, and nothing is to be allowed to interrupt the work. So he, um, Haskell employed different methods, different methods. He worked with teams and he op opened different ministries to reach the people. And you see, that's why I, I'm, I give this seminar the name Front Door versus Side Door. What is a front door? Front door is every program every activity that you do in your local church in order to attract people, to make people come and see what is taking place in your local church. I suppose that, at least in Brazil, about 90%, 80 to 90% of our churches uh, reach people through this kind of front door activities. Uh, you can see here, today, there is a, a very popular topic of discussion between uh, attractional and missional churches. I have told you that attractional is like the centripetal strategy in which tends to attract people from outside to a center. And missional church are those who use this centrifugal strategy. I mean, that move people from one center to reach people in the extremities. So, effective churches today, they actually practice both approaches. Uh, they need to be attractional, but they need to be missional to, uh, uh, to see the attractional approach here. Uh, basically, uh, there's a, a very good method to identify and to connect with people who are interested, who are receptive, you know, to spiritual things. Because people who are receptive, they tend to go to your church, but not people who are more secular. And the way this church do these things is by promoting church events to hope that visitors will attend those events and to encourage the visitors
to stay. That's uh, the attraction of our approach. I suppose many churches that are here practice this kind of approach here. You do events and you expect people to come. But mostly the people who come are people very receptive. You know, uh, the, uh, you see here uh, that the front door can use this kind of activities. For example, friendship. Most of the people who come to our churches come through friendship evangelism. Invitation made by a contagious Christian. Or some special event that you promote in your church. Or some occasional visit that people come. If I would ask uh, here, for example, uh, how do you come to know the, the truth? How do you come to know Jesus? You'll be amazed to see the answers here. For example, how many of you uh, were rich through public evangelism? Raise your hand. You, one, two, three, four. No. One, two, three, four. Okay. How many of you uh, come to the church through literature? Some copper to knock at your door and sell some book, you raise your hand, let me see. One, anybody else? Just one. How many of you come to the church through uh, uh, education, through a, an Adventist school? Raise your hand. Through an uh, Adventist school, one. Anybody else? You, two. Okay, how many of you come to the church through Television or radio? No one here? Oh, that's one there. How many of you come to the church because one pastor gives you Bible studies? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, how many of you come to the church because you... Uh, discover the church by yourself because during your journey you went to one church it doesn't fit to you so you come to another and you come to the Seventh-day Adventist is there anybody here no nope. let me ask you now how many of you come to the church because of the influence of one friend or, or, or one parent a friend or parents? Raise your hand. Hide. You see? Look around and see now. Raise, keep your hands up. You see? Approximately 75% of people who come to the church came through friendship evangelism. That's why it's so important to make it intentional. Uh, many people come to the church that way. Okay? And while front door provide a way for people to come to your church, missional approach, uh, in other words, the side door, provide a way for the church to go where people are. Do you understand the difference? The front door, you wait people to come. The side door, the mission away, the church go to reach people where they are. So, uh, front door, people come to the church. Side door, the church goes to the people. That's the best way to, uh, to fulfill Acts 1.8. That's the mission now. When Jesus said that you should be a practice mission in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and in the ends of the earth. That's uh, a, a way in which the church practice a strategy of invasion, not only of concentration, but the church go out and meet people where people are. You see, that's a, a, ver a very good point here. Many churches don't grow because they just wait people to come. They just have front door 
only in attractional way. But the church that grows, they need to be missional. They need to open side door. They need to get people where people are, not just wait them to, to come. That's the side door. And how do you do that? You do that through community projects, through small groups, Sabbath school branch, or maybe some special ministries, or support groups, groups of evangelism. Um, I think only 10% of churches are practicing that. Only 10%. Almost 90, 80 to 90% are attractional. Just 10 to 20 percent are missional church. They go where people are. And you know, it's a very important point here because people, people, many people will never come to the church except in times of wedding or funerals. That's the two moments in which secular people usually come to the church. That's why it's important for the church to go after people. Are you with me? Uh, and see, uh, there are many ways to open side doors. You can do some support and recovery groups. I have shown you uh, this morning some ministries different people doing different ways of reaching people. For example, example, families with husbands in prison, there are others. They are ministering to homeless families. Others are ministering to children with learning disabilities. You can see street dwellers, special disability, prison ministries. So there are many support ministries. You can do it for unemployed, for added people, for single mothers, for refugees, and I show you many uh, different ways to do that. Uh, put attention here. Raise the sound, please. Many times we became amazed to see that the simple ways that people are doing to reach people. Os pacientes que recebi uma listinha, né? E ele era um deles. E inicialmente o Marcos ele bastante emotivo, ele chorava bastante nas, nas sessões. Mas ele também falava de Deus assim com uma forma convincente, uma forma alegre, é, com muito entusiasmo. E eu sempre ouvia o Marcos, né? Eu sempre gostava de ouvir o Marcos porque ele contava aquilo com bastante entusiasmo. Na verdade, assim, eu no começo eu duvidava, achava, eu digo, mas ela não vai se interessar assim por um, né? É um assunto que também me interessava e, e a maneira como ele falava, assim, ele se emocionava bastante eu via que aquilo era sincero. Ele falava com convicção, não falava da boca para fora. O grande pregador em questão é o Marcos, 22 anos, portador da síndrome de Wardenburg tipo 2. É uma síndrome muito rara, o Marcos não tem, assim, é, grande comprometimento, mas ele tem algumas é, características dessa síndrome. A despigmentação da pele, é, a deficiência mental leve, mas tem. Mas e daí? Quem disse que alguém com deficiência mental não pode falar de Deus? É, uma vez ele falou isso, que, eles iam que os adventistas iam sofrer porque viria uma lei. E eu não sabia nada disso, né? Porque é, eu era católica e eu não sabia disso. Eu ficava assim, mas como hoje em dia é tão... É, como é que é se respeitar tantos valores, os direitos das pessoas? Por que, que eles vão sofrer se eles não são submetidos à Igreja Católica? Daí, aí isso começou. Uma vez ela me perguntou sobre que, o que, que é essa lei dominical uma vez. E o que, que você escondeu? É, é os finais dos tempos que, 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 vai, que, vai, que vai surgir. E o que, que você fazia quando você não sabia responder? Eu, eu vim até a minha mãe e falava para ela, de, ela ia até lá e na, na inserção de massagem, ela respondia as, as perguntas da Rosa. Aí entrou em cena a dona Yolanda, para continuar explicando o que o filho não conseguia. Mas já que a psicóloga queria saber demais, o jeito foi um método mais definitivo. O grande conflito. 
eu olhei para ela e pensei, puxa vida, esse é um assunto assim que é o último que você explica para a pessoa, não, não o primeiro, né? Quando eu falei da senhora White que, que, que esse livro ia explicar melhor sobre a lei dominical, ela se interessou pelo livro, ela se interessou pelo assunto. Aqui eu acredito que eu comecei a, a querer saber mais mesmo. Né? Aí eu acredito que se eu não tivesse lido O Grande Conflito, eu não teria mudado. Foi decisivo para mim. Cla claro que o, a, a, o estudo bíblico depois foi interessante, né? Muito interessante, mas eu penso que o grande conflito foi fundamental. Eu li aquele livro com uma avidez, eu comecei a ler e não queria mais parar. Por quê? É porque respondeu é, dúvidas, dúvidas básicas que eu tinha. O resultado da sementinha que o Marcos plantou foi o batismo da sua psicóloga. A doutora Rosa aceitou a Cristo e aprendeu do seu paciente que disposição de pregar não depende de inteligência, mas de submissão. E que deficiente, louco mesmo, é quem rejeita essa mensagem. Eu imagino que, que Deus pode se servir de qualquer membro, de qualquer instrumento para falar. Não é isso? Deus me deu capacidade. Para falar do amor dEle. E por que você acha que tem capacidade de falar do amor de Deus? Por causa que Deus está me dando muita sabedoria. Que quando que eu estou sozinho no meu quarto, eu sempre, sempre peço muita sabedoria para Ele. Para fazer, fazer a obra dEle. Porque daí, aí, aí além da, da terapia, eu pude evangelizar ela na, na, na terapia também. Você que fez terapia nela? Eu que fiz terapia nela. É uma felicidade assim que não tem explicação. É uma, um, uma, um assunto que não tem explicação. Ou melhor, que tem explicação. É só pelo poder de Deus, porque eu sei que pelo Alexandre, né? Jamais ele sozinho você, né, faria isso. Mas eu sei que Deus tem usado muito, muito o Alexandre. Não só com a Rosa, muitas outras pessoas, né? A família veio buscar um serviço e me trouxeram um outro bem maior. Aí tá uma estrela na minha coroa. Por, por causa que, que, eu, que eu não pensei que eu ia conseguir converter uma, uma doutora. Eu acho que todo mundo pode fazer esse trabalho. Por que você acha isso? Porque esse trabalho, esse trabalho é só, só a gente saber, saber, saber andar nos caminhos de Deus e, e saber, saber a, hora, a, hora, a hora exata de falar as co coisas certas na hora exata. É, e é ele, um aluno da Pai que resolveu pregar e distribuir livros missionários. Pelo convite e amizade do Marcos Alexandre, outras 15 pessoas resolveram montar um pequeno grupo de estudo da Bíblia. E ele mesmo dá estudo para outras seis, com a ajuda de um garotinho que lê e responde as perguntas para ele. E essa ajuda é necessária por um motivo bem simples. Quantos livros você já leu? Nenhum, porque eu não sei ler. E você deu um livro para ela? Uhum. Por quê? Para ela ler que eu sabia que, ela, que aquele livro ia fazer diferença na vida dela. Não, você não leu ele? Não, nem mais. Me falar se você quer converter uma pessoa, dê, dê um bom livro para ela ler. Eu acho que eu vou ser evangelista. Porque eu, eu amo falar desse meu Deus. Porque mesmo a fé que eu pratico, eu quero, eu quero que essas pessoas pratiquem também. Quero ser evangelista. Ele é um grande evangelista. Essas crianças como o Alexandre e outros meninos que a gente vê, eles não têm dificuldade para aceitar ninguém. E as pessoas que se dizem normais têm dificuldade para aceitar eles. Então isso é muito triste, né? A linguagem do amor, qualquer pessoa entende. Não precisa ter nem inteligência ou sabedoria. A linguagem do amor eles entendem. Porque para Deus nada é impossível. É interessante que, muitas vezes, deixe-me mostrar aqui, nós temos alguns serviços. Groups, there are ministries doing evangelism. Uh, we can mention, for example, people that are opening some of these 
motorcyclist ministries, university ministries, ethnic ministries, small groups, preaching points. They are going outside instead of waiting people to come. They are meeting people where they are in order to take the gospel to them. I'd like to show you one more example of what our people are doing. This guy, he is a very intelligent guy. Um, see how he used his talents. He's a very bright, smart guy. And look at his story. His name is Anderson. Débora, eu lembrei que hoje sai o resultado daquele último concurso que eu fiz. Ah, é? Sério? Dá uma olhada aí então pra gente ver. Será que vai dar? Será que você passou? O que você acha? Acho que sim. Acertou! Sério? Que legal! Você sabe que não é novidade, né? Você já passou em 24 concursos? Por que você também não faz concursos? Ah, esse é meu sonho. Lógico que eu quero estudar. Eu posso te ajudar. A gente pode separar um tempo, colocar uma sala de estudos, eu trago material. Ah, então a gente vai tentar? Todo dia de manhã, né? A gente estuda. Sabe que você me deu uma ideia? Foi aí que tudo começou. Nós decidimos montar um grupo de estudos, reunir algumas pessoas que não tinham condições de pagar um cursinho, para que elas também tivessem, alcançassem o sonho de concurso público. Nós não tínhamos local adequado, mas conversamos e conseguimos um local ao fundo da igreja, não tinha iluminação adequada, não tinha toda a estrutura necessária de uma sala de aula. Mas o importante é estarmos juntos estudando. E começamos aí um grupo de estudos que nós temos até hoje. Desde que decidiu ingressar no mundo dos concursos, o estudo faz parte da rotina diária you know de Anderson. Porém, ele não, não abre as apostilas sem public, antes orar uh, just, e abrir o livro mais importante, here. a Bíblia. Depois do primeiro dia de aula... It's a kind of public exam that allows uh, to be accepted in very high jobs, you know. First, you, get, you need to pass the exams in order to be accepted. He's very smart. He passed 24 exams. Now he is opening a class to help other people to, to get in. In that, in that exam o número student. de alunos foi aumentando e para dar conta do recado, Anderson precisou formar uma equipe de professores voluntários. Um dos integrantes desta equipe é Alex, que através do curso teve a oportunidade de voltar para os caminhos de Deus. Eu fui adventista no período da minha infância e pré-adolescência, me afastei, mas com a oportunidade de ministrar as aulas de matemática aqui no cursinho até passar, eu tive a oportunidade de voltar ao convívio com a igreja e as atividades. Então, senti o chamado de Deus para poder rebatizar e hoje eu sou membro da igreja adventista do sétimo dia. Até passar. Este é o nome que Anderson escolheu para o curso. Afinal, ele não quer que ninguém saia dali sem obter os resultados desejados. Eu louvo muito a Deus e agradeço a Deus porque o irmão Anderson está fazendo esse trabalho aqui conosco, né? Dando essas aulas. Ele tira um tempo da, que, que ele poderia estar com a família dele, né? Cuidando da família. E ele está aqui nos ajudando. E é um curso gratuito, né? Então, por isso, nós temos que agradecer muito a Deus por isso. O Anderson é uma pessoa de grande importância para mim, incentivadora. Graças a ele, ao grupo de estudos, eu tive sucesso de passar em vestibulares em concurso público, a qual eu estou tomando posse. Anderson é graduado em Direito e atua como analista do Tribunal de Justiça do Distrito Federal, em Planaltina. Mais de 100 alunos já assistiram às aulas do cursinho. Ele quer que este número aumente cada vez mais e, principalmente, que outros multipliquem a iniciativa. Ao utilizar os meus conhecimentos e minha experiência em passar em concursos públicos para ajudar outras pessoas que estão nesse mesmo caminho, eu fui uma das pessoas mais abençoadas nesse processo. Essa foi a forma que eu encontrei para contribuir com a missão da igreja. Durante as aulas, eu também falo de Jesus para eles e ofereço estudos bíblicos. Alguns, além de passar em concursos, também já se batizaram. Eu convido a todas as pessoas a usarem seus talentos e ajudar outros. Viverem essa mesma experiência. Com certeza, eles serão os mais abençoados. You see, people are open these ministries to, to meet people where they are. Uh, last two weeks ago, the, one of the, our broadcasting transmitted this news. Falou aqui no começo do Rick Vanguarda, do grande movimento de rolê 
Pinheiros pela Via Dutra, que estão indo em direção à Aparecida. Aparecida é a Pilgrim Pil 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 City, um onde eles vão para adorar esses idols. E seguem para a Aparecida. O pessoal da Igreja Adventista montou um posto de apoio no trecho de Itapaté. They, a, a group of Adventists helped the pilgrims from the Catholic Church that was, were going to worship those, uh, uh, Mary, the Mary statue. Yeah, it's just just an example of ministry, of what people are doing outside there. So there are many ways: church planting teams, university ministry, motorcycles, parish nursing, cooking classes, uh, health fair. I mean, there is uh, one uh, respected church consultant who said that most regular church attendees today who were born before 1990 came to the church through front door. But after 1990, many people are coming to the church through side door. In other words, they, many of them are no longer coming to the church. They found Jesus because some Christians went to them and, and reached them where uh, they are. So I, I put, I, I, I'm going to show you some uh, reasons why the church should open more of these side door events instead of just being a front door, just uh, attractional. The, the number one reason is because more people will be rich for your church. And the reason for that is because uh, many people, you put it here, as our culture become less and less Christian, fewer people are taking the initiative to attend church-sponsored events. Uh, that's a very famous book wrote by Dan Kimball. He said they like Jesus, but they don't like the church. That's the, the main aspect, characteristic of these secular people. Many of them like this, but they don't want to go to, to the church. The other reason is because uh, when you open more of these side door events, more spiritual gifts will be used by the members of your church. Ellen G. White says, in connection with the proclamation of the message in large cities, there are many kinds of work to be done by laborers with varied gifts. Some are to labor in one way, some are to labor in another. The Lord desires that the city shall be worked by the united efforts of laborers of different capacities. See, uh, more different kinds of people. Ooh. Okay? More different kinds of people uh, will be rich. You see, um, our church tends to be more homogeneous. I mean, uh, we look the same, we sound the same, we talk the same, we just reach people that are very similar to us. But when we open side door events, we uh, start reaching different people in the community. For example, uh, if your church reach, uh, reach for deaf people, they will reach the family of the deaf people or people who like churches, who care, care enough for these deaf people. So when you look for these people, you reach more people. Another reason is that, uh, you see, more members will be involved in the church. So you can see different shape, 
pegs, like uh, triangles, um, cylinders, cubes, hexagonal, and you can see the holes at the, as um, ministry positions. You see, many people just don't fit in many functions in our church. And that's why um, you see that in many churches there is not enough places to get people involved. Or not enough right places for people to get involved. In a church to grow, some specialists said that it needs at least 60 places of ministry or service for every 100 people. So if you open more uh, side door events, more ministries, more people will be involved. More people will be in, involved in your church. Um, a survey done by somebody here said that in many churches, only 20% of people in the church do 80% of the work. But it's still very optimistic because in many churches, it's even less uh, than that. But if you mobilize people according to their interests, priorities, passion, more people will be involved in a church. You see here, many churches unfortunately tend toward the left end of the scale. Uh, you see, there is a low motivation when people is involved in service just for duty, for coercion, for durance or force. But there is more involvement when people are involved for something that they desire, according to their passion, that create personal fulfillment in them. They do it by love. And, and that's the difference, make all the difference. Uh, many times when you try to motivate people using only the institutional agenda, many people just don't involve. But if you use the personal agenda, when they act according to their passion, their spiritual gifts, many of them will be involved in the, in the church. Another reason, more people, new people will stay. Look what uh, some author says about that. They say, he said, uh, those most likely to become active members are those who become part of the group and develop meaningful relationship with others in that group before formally uniting with that congregation. Do you, I, I understand in that? In other words, a church who has more side door activities tend to have a, a higher assimilation rate, rate in, in, in the church. You know, because when you open ministries, people tend to be assimilated first be, before they, are, they unite to that church. Are you with me or not? Uh, see, uh, that's the normal way that we reach people. Usually it happens in that sequence, at this, this stage of faith. First, we give them Bible studies or we preach. So people believe first, then belong, and then they become. That's the natural way that things happen in, in, in many churches. So uh, people to, to come to our church, they need to first believe. But many people are leaving the churches with this kind of methodology, and especially in very sophisticated societies, secular places. People need first to belong. Belong first, believe, then become. You see, that's how the Pathfinders Club is growing. Because many people, many kids that come to the Pathfinders Club, they just belong. Then later on, they believe and actually they become part of, of the church. So many people that come to, to, the church, uh, to your church, maybe they don't, don't come for doctrines. They don't come for Bible. Many of them come just to make some connections, to know some friends. So let them belong first. Belong first. Let them be involved in something bigger than themselves. And eventually, they will 
be interested in knowing the truth uh, and become part of the church. That's the way we connect people from very secular societies. You know, uh, I don't understand in here. And another reason is that there is a correlation between the number of units that you open in your church with the growth of your church. Uh, it says that the more units you open, the more growth your church will experience. For example, if the church have opened more uh, small groups, more ministries, more uh, choirs or Pathfinders Club, or let's say uh, that's where, why many conferences that open more churches grows more or more uh, the union when they open more conference they usually grow more so the more units you open in your church the more your church will grow if your church has just two classes of Sabbath school it, it will grow lesser less than another church that has let's say 10 classes of Sabbath school because more unit means more grow. Do you understand that? Okay? And, uh, and now I finish. How could we open more units, more side door events, more ministries or more small groups in the church? First of all, preach about that. Teach people about that. Uh, address the fact that every person is unique. Every person, ha person has special talents and gifts that need to be used for the mission of the church. Uh, you can maybe give people these I wish cards. You can put it in the church. You can teach and preach and give these cards to them and this God just say, when I think about our church and ways we could make a difference for people in this community, I wish we could have a ministry for, to reach who? If you would be interested in helping to make your wish come true, write your name and contact information below. Chances are greatly improved that something will happen if you are willing to be a part. Then put this card in the offering plate, so, 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 so. So give people opportunity to give uh, uh, ideas, uh, suggestions in what kind of area need to be addressed. Uh, another point, do a congregational survey. Uh, you can put some uh, materials for them. Would you like to start a new ministry or a small group in the so, so, uh, church? Would like to, we'd like to help you. So try to identify people who want to open their homes or are trying to do that. Uh, another way is to, is to, uh, to talk about that in new members, in new members class orientation. I don't know if your church have a new members class for people, for visitors who come by the first time in the Sabbath school. But if some of these people come to your church, give them orientation in how they could use their talents to reach people. Another way, build a dream team. Uh, the passion of at least one person is essential for the build of a ministry, but the passion of just one person is not enough. They, he need to work with a a team, so you can work with that. Another uh, research, other ministries, what other churches are doing for reach this kind of people or this uh, other kind of people. So you can make case study from church one, two, three. You can read all that many related organizations are doing. You can check on our website, read some articles, books, and so on. Another, uh, describe. Describe. Oh, man. 
describe the target audience, get all information possible about those characteristics. And finally, determine the strategy. See, you can go from stage one, trying to find out the external needs to their internal needs and to their eternal needs. The external needs usually are these, um, the, uh, like, for example, I need to, to stop smoking or I need to get read from drugs or something like that. The internal need is friendship. Many people need to be connected with other in relationship. An eternal need, you know what is that. It's the truth. And finally, you publicize your ministry. I'm going to finish with this book here, Acres of Diamond. Have you read this book, Acres of Diamond, before? It's a story, it's a classic story of written by Russell Cumwells. And it describes a man, a farmer, who used to live uh, in India, in the mountains of India. He was a very rich farmer. He has a farm full of orchards, full of cattle, grain fields, gardens, and so on. Very wealthy, very happy man. But one day, somebody came to his land, to his farms, and this uh, man described the fortunes made by people who, who are, were discovering these diamond mines. And um, he told about these beautiful stones, and people who had has this stone could buy everything he dreamed of. So at that night, that farmer went to the bed as a poor man, because he, he thought, I'd like to, to have those diamonds, to buy everything that I need. And the next day, he wake up very early and went, sought out for that stranger. And he asked them, asked him for directions, uh, asked him where he could find this diamond. And, and the man described it, that he would find it in higher mountains where there are sand of this kind of sand and so on. And that man sold his farm. He put his family in the family's care and he went looking for these diamonds. And his search everywhere. He went to mountains, valleys, deserts, plains. Finally, he I discovered that uh, he did a, a very foolish things. And after losing everything, his health, he put an end on his own life. And uh, the guy who bought his farm, one day was walking along the, the stream of his property. And suddenly, he looked down and he noticed what? curious flash of light. He took that stone, put it in his house, someone else looking, where did you find this diamond? No, it's not a diamond, it's just a, no, it is a diamond. Where did you find it? They went there and discovered many other diamonds. That's the true story of the mine of Golconda. Golconda. You see the diamond over there is the diamond that it's in the crown of Elizabeth. And you see, that's the original, the true story. And it reminds us, it's, this story reminds us that in your church, there are many people, many people who has flesh of light in his eyes, people who has passions, who has talents. And if you just shape those talents, if you just recruit these people and send them out to open many of these side door events, you reach the world. You reach many people for Jesus. That's 
That's your job as a leader of church. To look for this bright in the eyes of the passion of people and help them to put their talents in service for the kingdom of God. Okay? And I hope everyone has a good night and God may bless you. Amen.